Well, good morning. I would like us to turn this morning our Bibles to the last chapter in John's Gospel. That would be John 21. John chapter 21. But first I would like to pray. Father, we thank you that your presence is with us here this morning. Lord, we thank you that you are lifted up on high. Father, we want to bow very low before you that we could uh, lift you very high and magnify your holy name. Lord, we want to hear from you this morning. Lord, you know that I'm not able uh, to, to speak uh, uh, these words to the hearts of your people. Lord, only you can do that. Lord, only you can speak to each one of us. Lord, only you can feed us with the good food of your word. Lord, and this is what we ask this morning. Lord, we pray that you would speak to us and that Jesus would be glorified and we would be brought closer to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Okay, the last chapter in John's Gospel. When I say that, John's Gospel, what do you, what do you think? For me, when, when I even hear John's Gospel being mes- mentioned, that fourth Gospel, I, I immediately think, what a wonderful, powerful, beautiful book that is, written in simple language and yet so profound. What a blessing this book is, this Gospel of John. From the breathtaking opening, we know how it opens. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was with God in the beginning, and and so it goes. A breathtaking opening until it comes to that verse, and the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us, or tabernacled among us. So from that op- those opening verses, through what John gives us is picture after picture, so I think of John as, a, as an artist, and he's, he's painting these pictures with words so that we're able to actually enter in and see the Lord Jesus. So we see Jesus through the gospel, gospel of John. Now, at one point, we see him calling disciples. Another moment, we see him speaking to the, the Jewish leader, Nicodemus, about the absolute necessity of, of the new birth. Here, we see him speaking to a lonely woman next to a well in Samaria. Here we see him healing again and again. Here we see him teaching. We see him working miracles, and and such miracles that the world world had never seen before. Uh, Signs, John calls them. And the working of miracles and the teaching went together because there would be the miracle, there would be the sign, and there would be the teaching uh, following that sign. We see him now, we see him raising the dead, at the tomb of Lazarus, calling him forth. And now we see him bent very low, down on the ground, washing his disciples' feet. We see him speaking. We see him praying to the Father, to, his, to, the, to the righteous Father, his Father, Holy Father. Now we see him betrayed, arrested, mocked, as they took their crown and, and, and stuck it on his head, this crown of thorns, mocked. We see him crucified, We see him buried. Now we see him gloriously raised from the dead. Appearing, that is, manifesting himself, making himself known, making himself seen to his disciples. So picture after picture, as we go through the chapter by chapter of John's Gospel, all that I've mentioned, I guess, takes us up to chapter 20. And you might think the Gospel should end there at chapter 20, because it seems like a fitting... Um, time to finish the gospel. And in fact, it seems that John does finish the gospel. And yet there's another chapter added, chapter 21. When you think about this gospel, you you think, how how would you end such a work? Such a masterpiece, if I can call it, if I can call it that. When when you consider the opening, how, how how would you end such a book as this. What would you expect the ending to be? That final chapter. Well, let's look at it. Let's turn to John chapter 21. And what we have here is actually another picture, another portrait. Think of it as the Holy Spirit enables you to imagine it in your mind's eye. Imagine it as a, as a movie playing before you, if you will. So beginning the, at the beginning of the chapter, 
After these things, Jesus manifested himself again to his disciples at the Sea of Tiberias. And he manifested himself in this way. Simon Peter and Thomas called Didymus and Nathaniel of Cana in Galilee and the sons of Zebedee and two others of his disciples were together. Uh, so there's seven of them. The, the main one being Peter, but then a few others are mentioned as well. Thomas, Nathaniel, John and James, the, the sons of Zebedee and um, a few others. So there's seven disciples. Okay, Verse 3. Simon Peter said to them, well, first of all it says uh, they, were, they were together. Now that, that's good. These seven were together. I don't know where the other um, four were. If we think in terms of 11, not 12 at the moment. Where were the other four? I don't know. But they were together. And, and Simon Peter said to them, I am going fishing. They, say, they said to him, we will also come with you. And let's just pause for a moment there. We, and we'll continue reading in a moment. But again, maybe just another question at the outset, which I was going to ask. And that is, um, think, think again of the whole book, the sweep of this whole gospel. And I want to ask you, what, what do you do when you've, when you've accomplished your divine mission? When, you, when you've accomplished what you came into the world to do? sent by the Father. What do you do? What do you do when you fulfill the words of the prophets? What do you do when you purchase souls for God? What do you do after you've conquered death? After you've defeated Satan? What, what do you do then? What is next? Well, you cook breakfast for your disciples on the shore of the lake. That's what you do. You cook breakfast. Amen. Let's make it stop there, and we just meditate upon that. But I just read the first three verses. Now, just reflecting on this, it seems to me that this time was this perhaps a confusing time for the disciples as to what should they do and now, at this point, I, I see it as in kind of an in-between time for the disciples, a time of waiting, and no doubt a time of uh, some questions in their minds, some uncertainties, because their ministry had not yet begun. So Jesus had finished his time on earth. He, he had finished his earthly ministry. And now, of course, he was about to ascend to the throne on high, to the highest place at the right hand of the Father. But they, the disciples, they, they had not yet entered into their life's work. They had, they had not received the promise of the Father yet. They had not been endued with power from on high. Had, they had not received the Holy Spirit yet. So it did not appear at this time what they would be. So I, I, I'm thinking there would be some questions going on in their, in their minds and some uncertainties in this kind of in-between time. Something certainly has been finished but something yet hasn't begun in between. So perhaps it was a time of them asking, what do we do? What do we do? Now, I think Peter must have had that thought. He must have, he must have thought about that question, not only for himself, but as we'll see in a moment later on, he even kind of asked that question on behalf of someone else, namely John. You know, Lord, what shall this man do? It's probably, what should I do? What should this man do? So this is the context. We have, we have this context, and there's Peter's words. I am going fishing. Very firm, direct. This is what he's going to do. I'm going fishing. And the others followed him, said, we will go with you. Just note in that that Peter was a leader. He was a leader. Somebody said, once said, you'll, you'll know if you're, leader, you're a leader or not if you turn around and there are people following you. I like that. Well, People were following Peter. Once he made it the initiative and said what he was going to do, quite firmly, quite decisively, he said, well, we'll come with you. 
We're all going to go fishing. These seven got in the boat and out they went. Now, what was going through Peter's mind? Well, perhaps it was something like this. Now, here is something I can do. This is something that I know about. Okay. Um, don't talk to me about fishing. I know all about fishing. This is what I do. This is my thing. Uh, this is what I'm confident in doing. This is the kind of work we know. We, we can do this. And it will be a good thing to do. And we have to eat. This will be a good, fruitful time to bring home a good catch. I'm going fishing. You know, I, I can't help thinking that there was a desire here to go back to the former times, to what was familiar. Uh, in this case, to the, to the return to those old familiar fishing nets. Now, I think, isn't this the tendency, especially during times of uncertainty or, or times of waiting, isn't there a tendency to, to fall back on what we know? To, to what brought us something good in the past? You know, we, we think back to former times. Um, and, and there was something that we were involved in that was good. It was valuable. It was a blessing. Formerly. And so, and so we seek to repeat it, to reproduce those familiar circumstances in which we felt so kind of at home and so confident in, and, and therefore we felt comfortable. What, what is familiar is comfortable to us. And there's a tendency to want to go back, even if we have to kind of try to, to engineer and circ uh, recreate circumstances the way they were before. There's a certain comfort. So here's Peter. Well, look. There's the boat. There's the nets. There's the water. Let's go. Let's do this. You know, but as soon as uh, we say and do such things, there's the great danger of, of relying on one's own strength and one's own ability. Yes, I, I have no doubt that Peter was an expert fisherman, that he, that he knew what he was doing. And, and I just don't think that it was anything wrong with what he had, had set out to do. I don't think there was a going back to the former ways in the sense of uh, backsliding. I don't, I don't sense that. I think he was just doing something. But in, in trying to go back to something that we seem to know so well, we know this so well, there's this danger of relying on one's own strength, one's own ability. We can also kind of see a coming full circle, because where did it all begin with these, especially the sons of Zebedee? Where, what were they doing when the Lord called them? They were occupied in their trade of fishing. They were mending their nets on the sea, I believe this very sea, Sea of Galilee. And Peter as well. Peter was in there together in this, in this fishing business. These were fishermen, and the Lord called them to himself, and they left their business. They left their fishing nets and they followed the Lord. And now we, we kind of almost come full circle to the, here they're back. Same lake, probably same nets, same boat, and there they were out in the water. But a few things that happened in between. Yeah, just a few things that happened in between. And of course, we remember Jesus' words to Peter. Uh, what did he say to him? I will make you fisher, fishers of men. Fishers of men. But, but they were called when they were occupied in that, in that business of fishing. So here they, here they are, these experienced fishermen. You get into the boat, and that night, they spent all night. Let's continue. Where do we leave off? I think we're, well, Peter said those words, I'm going fishing. They said to him, we will also come with you. Now, these guys know what they're doing. I'm sure that it was going to be a really a fruitful time. So let's read. They went out and got into the boat, and that night they caught nothing. Nothing. Yes, absolutely nothing. They were out all night. 
I, I can remember uh, staying up all night studying for an exam. It was it was pretty tough. I, but I but I, I forced myself to stay up all night. Has anybody any students have you ever done that before? No, stayed up all night, pulled an all nighter as they say. Anyway, these these fishermen were out all night, and it, and it wasn't an easy occupation. They they had to have some strength and some patience and be out there throughout the entire night. But they caught nothing. They had nothing to show for it. And no doubt they were disappointed. And no doubt they were tired and hungry. And not only that, to make it worse, there was a witness to their failure. For, for, for when the day was breaking, and let me just pause there, when the day was breaking, and what a time that is. When, when you've been up all night out there on the lake, and, and that sun just starts to come. And this is the breaking of the dawn. What a beautiful time of day it is. What a peaceful time. Uh, the light starts to come back. Let's pick it up from where we left off. We're up to verse 4 now. But when the day was now breaking, Jesus stood on the beach. Yet the disciples did not know that it was Jesus. So Jesus said to them, Children, you know, and <clears throat> let me stop there for a minute. They were out there some way, not too far, but I, I still think that Jesus would have had to, to yell out to, to be heard. But in the quiet of the morning, in the peace of the morning, and uh, words carry, sounds carry farther across the water, th those words that came from Jesus' mouth would have carried across the water and entered those ears. Children! And they don't know who this person was. Who, who is this person? Children, he says. You haven't caught anything, have you? Who, who, who was this person? They didn't know at first that it was Jesus. And they must have really wondered. You know, it was dawn, but it had not dawned on them that it was the Lord standing there, that, it, that the, the sun was rising, but they didn't realize that the sun, was, the sun of righteousness was rising with healing in its wings. And they must have thought it very strange when this person yelled out to them in a loud voice. And the words came to them, Children, you do not have any fish, do you? Maybe they thought, how does he know? But let's just stop on that first word, children, for a minute. I know some translations have it as uh, friends or something like that. Uh, but, but I like children. And, and every other time that word is used in Scripture, it's actually referring to other in infants or just young, young children. So, so he, here was this uh, stranger to them, still at this point, yelling out children. I wonder what they thought when they heard that. I mean, these, these were grown men. These were strapping men. These were tough men. These were strong men. And, uh, you know, usually when you say children, it's, it's um, I think probably, perhaps Christina, a teacher, would refer to her classes as children. Children come in. Children sit down. Children do this. We, we, we think of um, speaking of the little ones. But, but to grown men, but that's the word. That's the word that was used. And isn't it wonderful that the Lord addressed these grown men in that way as children? I, I think it's so precious. Of course, it has nothing to do with age. didn't matter what age they were. Uh, it has to do with relationship. They were beloved children. Those were God, these were God's dear ones, purchased, beloved, upon, upon whom his eye rests. Those are under his protective care. Children. You know, even to say the word, we, we think of immediately of, of the, the care that parents have for their children. You know, if, uh, if they're out running around, the eyes of the parents know where they are. This one's over here, this one's over here. They, they don't take their eyes off of them for very long. And so, as so as God's children, so it is with us. God is God's eyes upon us. His care, His tender care and love, is upon us. 
Well, so the disciples must have wondered what this uh, stranger was doing there so early in the morning, early hours of the morning, calling out. But he must have spoke with some authority when he said, cast, cast a net on the other side of the boat. Um, so first of all, in response to his question, children, you have not caught any fish, have you? They answered him, no. And he said to them, cast the net on the right-hand side of the boat and you will find a catch. Well, again, you wonder what was going on through their minds. They might have thought, well, you've got to be kidding me. We've been out here all night and we've caught nothing. And this stranger is saying that, but they did. Nevertheless, they, they did. And what happened? So they cast, and then they were not able to haul it in because of the great number of fish. Well, let me continue reading, shall we? Just picture this. Picture all this that's going on in this scene. So there they are. They, they, they've got this huge catch of fish. They're trying to haul it into the boat. And therefore that disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, it is the Lord. You know, perceptive John. I, I believe this was John describing himself as the disciple whom, Je whom Jesus loved. <laughs> Just those words, it is the Lord. So when, when, when Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, what, what did he do? He put his outer garment on, for he was stripped for work, and threw himself into the sea. Yeah, as, as you do. Peter, 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 what were you thinking? Probably he wasn't thinking. You know, if John was the, the one with the quick insight to, to know, to say it was the Lord, he was the perceptive one. Peter was the impulsive one. Time and time we, we see him doing things without thinking, just rushing headlong into something. That was the way he was. And there really wasn't any time for Peter to kind of think what to do or plan what to do. All he knew was this. He was there. Jesus was there. And all he wanted was to be where Jesus was. Now, don't you just love Peter at this, at this time? You know, the others are just holding the net. It's the Lord. Peter grabs his gun. Throw, hurls himself into the sea <laughs> and starts to swim and he swims, he swims he doesn't care he, he's got to get to the shore because Jesus is there what a scene that is and so there's Peter reaching the shore before anybody else and there's the Lord Now, I just wonder what transpired. You know, we, we don't know. And I'm, I'm never for speculation. We, we don't need speculation, we need revelation. And we're not told. But we certainly do have a picture in front of us. There's Peter eventually climbing out of the water, dripping wet. And there's the Lord. There's Peter, dripping wet. And there's the Lord. Just the two of them. What, what was spoken between them? We don't know. Did Peter speak first? Did, did, did he just look in his eyes? Did he, did he again say, say Lord, Lord, I'm sorry. I'm sorry I denied you. We don't know. Did the Lord address Peter? We don't know. Were there any words spoken at all? We don't know. All we know is there's Jesus and there's a soaking wet Peter. And there's the others slowly making their way to shore. Of course, there was another occasion too. I just, you know, we just can re remember. You know, I wonder what the other disciples thought. You know, when Peter just th jumped into the sea, um, they said, "Hang on, hang on, Peter. There's, and we know we want to get to, to the Lord, but the sea is in the way. There's this little problem. We got all this water." Um, and he, he probably would have said, "So." Because there was another time when the water separated him from his Lord. 
Do you remember they were, they were in the boat and there was Jesus coming walking on the water? And again, Jesus wanted to be with him. And he said, Lord, if it is you, bid me come. And the Lord said, come. And out of the boat, he stepped and he started to walk. He, he was not one to let water or anything else stand in the way if he wanted to get to the Lord. Of course, he, he began to sink on that occasion, as we know. So if they said to them, if, if they tried to pull him back and say, Peter, what are you doing? He said, no. He jumped in. He hurled himself into the water and swam. He must have been a good swimmer. Well, the disciples eventually arrived at the scene. They would have been sort of slow going because they had to come in the boat pulling the net along with them. And what did they find when they, when they got there? Well, it says that, uh, okay, let's, let's read and see. Verse 9. So, so, when they got on, so when they got out on the land, they saw a charcoal fire already laid and fish placed on it and bread. And Jesus said to them, Bring some of the fish which you have now caught. Simon Peter went up and drew the net to land, full of large fish, 153. And although there were so many, the net was not torn. Again, it makes us think of another time in the Gospels when the Lord did something similar when they were fishing. He said, draw and put out your net here, and they did. And they caught such an enormous amount of fish that that time the nets were breaking and the boats were in danger of sinking. But here, they were bringing the net and the net wasn't breaking. And this also tells me, you know, we just get insights. Peter must have been a strong man because it says that he went over there and hauled the net himself. He, he, he was, I just picture Peter as a tough man, muscles. You know, a muscular man like Brother um, Spiro. So he goes over there and he pulls the um, fish in. It's, isn't it amazing? You know, I don't want to talk about this, but somebody counted them. They probably they had an accountant among them who was good at counting. And one, two, three, 153 fish they caught on that occasion. Wow. Um, anyway, when the disciples got there, they found a charcoal fire and fish and bread. Jesus said, bring some of the fish you have caught. And then we hear Jesus saying these words. Come and have breakfast. Ah, breakfast. It's the best meal of the day. Well, provided it's not rushed. If, if you have a bit of leisure, if you have time to enjoy breakfast, I think the breakfast is the, is the best meal of the day. But I don't know about you, but breakfast on the beach with Jesus? Could there be anything better than that? What a picture is painted for us here. And not only is it breakfast on the shore with the Lord Jesus, but Jesus had provided everything. He had made all the preparations necessary. He provided the food. He cooked the food. He served the food. And he invites them, come and have breakfast. He did everything. You know, and here, don't we again see the servant heart of the Lord? Don't we again see the one who said, I came to serve? Now, this is the, this is the risen Lord. This is the risen, glorified Jesus, and he's still serving. They come around this fire. How welcome they must have been after a night out on the water. How hungry they must have been. And, and here's Jesus serving them, the fish and the bread. And that can really speak to us and tell us something about our own lives of service that we should be doing in, in imitation of the Lord. And, just, and not too about how practical Jesus is. One thing, he is he, very practical. Because he, he did have things he wanted to say to his disciples, especially to Peter on this occasion. He had some things he wanted to say. But first, first, let's eat. Let's sit down around this fire. Let's enjoy fellowship together. And let's eat this meal. Why? Why? Why put that ahead of 
those important things that he wanted to say to Peter. It's simple. He knew they would be hungry. That's it. Come, let's eat. Let's have breakfast together. Now let's, um, let's, let's move on to the next part of this. Because, um, <clears throat> because when they had finished, and you want to kind of linger there, don't you? I, I just want to stay there. I just want to see. I just want to kind of enter in to that fellowship meal. Uh, fresh fish. What did they talk about as they ate? We don't know. They just enjoyed being together with each other. But when they had finished, Jesus began to question Peter. And we know, I guess we're quite familiar with this part of the, of the picture. He questions Peter in regard to uh, the, the, this disciple's love for himself. So let's start, start reading in verse 15. Verse 15. So when they had finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? He said to him, Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, Tend my lambs. He said to him again a second time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He said to him, Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, Shepherd my sheep. He said to him the third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was grieved because he had said to him the third time, do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. Jesus said to him, tend my sheep. Let's pause. There's many things we could go into uh, I guess some details. He doesn't refer to him as Peter, that, that rock. He says Simon, son of John. We could talk about perhaps the different words for love, but I don't want to go into that, um, that, that are used in this passage. I just want to focus on the, the three times that Jesus said, do you love me? First of all, it was more than these, which I take me more, more than these others love me. Because Jesus, um, Peter's boast previously was, Lord, even if all forsake you, I will not forsake you. I'm ready to die for you. And that was just so very soon after he denied the Lord. And Peter was grieved. And we remember, and many people point this out, that he denied his Lord three times. And here we have the Lord asking him three times, do you love me? You know, in Peter's words, Peter at this stage, he was a pretty humbled man, I believe, at this point. He said, Lord, you know. Lord, you know all things. Peter had knew the Lord. He, he knew that there was nothing that you could hide from him. The Lord knew his heart. And, and so he says, Lord, you know. You know I love you. You know I love you. And then there's that response each time. Again, slightly different words, but I don't think the meaning changes very much. Tend my lambs. Shepherd my sheep. Tend my sheep. So Jesus was here reinstating Peter. He was giving him his work, his ministry. So if we go back, if there was a question, what do I do now? What, is, what do I do? Here the Lord is making it very clear to Peter, to this, to this disciple. There was, there was a ministry. He was saying, it's, it's, uh, Peter is not fishing. It's shepherding. You're going you're to be a shepherd to my sheep. And I just want to say here, sheep need a shepherd. Sheep must have a shepherd. Now notice it was not an office that, that, that Jesus was giving him. Not complete control, leadership over all the others, no. It was a work, it was a ministry of tending, feeding, caring for the sheep. And notice also that Jesus said, my sheep, tend my sheep, my lambs. And Jesus' concern and care 
is for his sheep, even his little lambs. So Peter denied the Lord three times publicly, and now publicly, because the others were there around, he was, uh, he was commissioning Peter, he was reinstating Peter. And this was followed by a revelation from the Lord as to how Peter would die. Or listen, listen, listen to the way John puts it. Um, verse uh, 18. Following that last uh, directive, tend my sheep, Jesus immediately says, Truly, truly, I say to you, when you were younger, you used to gird yourself and walk wherever you wished. But when you grow old, you will stretch out your hands and someone else will gird you and bring you where you do not wish to go. Now, how does the John interpret? How does the Apostle John interpret this? Verse nineteen. Now, this he said, signifying by what kind of death he would glorify God. Not not just what kind of death that Peter would die, but what kind of death he would glorify God. Peter was to glorify God in the type of death that Jesus was predicting would be his one day. And when he had spoken this, that is when Jesus had spoken this, he said to him, follow me. Those two crucial words, follow me. Again, we're kind of right back to the very beginning, the, probably the very first words that were spoken to Peter, follow me, and he did. And now here is again, after all that had transpired, including the denials, it's again, two words, follow me. And what, what, what the depth of meaning that is in the light of what Jesus had just said. And tradition has it that Peter was crucified uh, in Rome, I believe. And so when, when Jesus was saying, follow me, wow, he was to follow in his master's footsteps one day even, even to, to a martyr's death. Well, <clears throat> follow me. Let me just... Close. I'm just going to close in a minute, but if we if we ask ourselves, did Jesus follow? I'm um, sorry, did Peter obey that command of the Lord Jesus to, to to shepherd the sheep, to feed the sheep? I think we have a wonderful answer in Peter's letter. Could we just turn to one Peter chapter five? And just just think how humble this man is. And this is, of course, written after many years of, of service to the Lord, of, of feeding the sheep, tending the sheep. Uh, we come to his letter, chapter 5, and this is what he writes. Peter says, Therefore I exhort the elders among you, as your fellow elder, and witness of the sufferings of Christ, and a partaker also of the glory that is to be revealed, shepherd the flock of God among you, exercising oversight, not under compulsion, but voluntarily, according to the will of God, and not for sordid gain, but with eagerness, nor yet as lording it over those allotted to your charge, but proving to be examples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the unfading crown of glory. Clearly, Peter was one shepherd. He was not the only shepherd. He was not the one supreme leader over the church, not by any means. He, he calls himself a fellow elder, a fellow shepherd. And he says to those other shepherds out there, feed the flock. You're not, you're not to lord it over them. You're not to be any kind of a dictator. You're not the boss. You're not the number one. You're not the, uh, you know, look at me. No, you're, you're to be a servant. You're to be humble. You're to feed the flock. You're to feed the sheep. You're to care for them. Well, all that a shepherd does in caring for the sheep, you're, you're to do that. You're to have your eye on the welfare, the well-being of the flock. That is God's flock. It's his sheep. And Peter did that. Praise God. One last point as, as I finish. And that is Peter turns around. Um, now that tells me that they must have been walking Again, I just find this so beautiful. Every single aspect I find it beautiful. From the meal to after the meal, did Jesus said, Peter, let's go for a walk? I don't know. Did Jesus just stand up and start walking and Peter 
He was not going to leave the Lord's side for a moment, but they were walking, and, Pe- and John was not far behind. So as we come to the end of this chapter, so back to John 21, I think this is important. Um, it's obviously important, otherwise it wouldn't be here. Uh, Peter, turning around, saw the disciple whom Jesus loved following them. And there's a bit, a bit of detail here. The one also who also leaned back on his bosom on the supper and said, Lord, who is the one who betrays you? So Peter, seeing him, said to Jesus, Lord, what about this man? What about this man? So Peter had been uh, given his uh, life's work, his ministry, his, his, his calling, um, his restoration. You know, all had been forgiven. And so it just turns around, and, and here's John, and, oh, Lord, what about this man? Perhaps thinking the Lord was going to then tell Peter, well, as far as he's concerned, this and this and the other thing. No, not at all. In fact, Peter, in fact the Lord rebukes him. He speaks to him directly and sternly. Jesus said to him, if I want him to remain until I come, what is that to you? You follow me. It's not your concern, Peter. Some one commentator said, it seems a bit harsh, but Jesus was in effect saying, it's none of your business about this man. And so it was a rebuke. And I think we, there's, as, we, as we come to the end of this great gospel, there's, there's a few things we can really need to take a hold of here. Uh, first of all, Jesus repeats his words, you follow me. What the ministry I have for, for John or for other ones, that's not your concern. There are different callings. There are different ministries. Clearly, John had a different ministry than Peter. We read in the book of Acts, Peter was prominent. He was the speaker. He was the one who was giving those uh, initial sermons. And people were being added to the church at, at Peter's preaching of the gospel. Where's John? He's there. Of course he's there. But we don't, there's not much said about him. Later, when John reached old age, he picked up pen and paper, Although it wasn't pen and paper, what was it? It was something and something. But he wrote. He had the sensitive John, the one who, the disciple whom Jesus loved. He wrote, and he wrote. And I am so thankful to God that he that he wrote his gospel, that he wrote those letters, that he wrote that book of Revelation. But there are different callers. There are different ministries. There and there's no sense of competition whatsoever. There's only a walking in obedience to the Lord, a following in Him. Not competing one with the other, not be concerned about um, what should this person do, what should that person, what, you know, I'd rather be doing what that person, no, this person I should do this, no, no, no competition, but a, a completing one another, a complementing one another in, in service together for the Lord, for His glory. And finally, uh, John feels it's important that he clears up a misunderstanding because um, when Jesus said, if I want him to remain until I come, what is that to you? You follow me. J- John just finishes by saying, therefore, this saying went out. See, see, rumors get started. You know, people start repeating things. The saying went out that among the brethren that, that this disciple would not die. Now, that, that's quite significant because if, as people were hearing this and believing it, oh, the Lord said um, John would not die. Um, and they could see John getting older and older and older. That, mean, that means that they, they knew the Lord was going to come back any moment. Um, but, but John was concerned about that because if he died, what did that mean as far as their thinking? So John clears up this. And he feels that he, he needs to say this. Um, he goes, Yet Jesus did not say to him that he would not die. Okay, Jesus never said that. He only said, if I want him to remain until I come, what is that to you? And he finished, this is the disciple who is testifying these things and wrote these things, and we know that his testimony is true. And so we come to the end of the gospel. Maybe my last final thought was, I I do see a, a very close relationship between Peter and John here, or throughout the gospels here, and in their ministry, even though their ministry is very different. And you sense that they, by nature, they were very different. Um, Peter and John, different by nature, united together in their love for the Lord Jesus. A different ministry, a different calling, 
no jealousy, no competition, complementing each other in, the, in what God had called them to do. May we all have the grace of God to do the same in our different spheres and walks, sensitive to what the Lord is calling us to do and to do, be obedient to that and do that with all of our hearts. Amen. God bless.